ladies and gentlemen, please come and join us for this fantastic new session that we're about to launch. Um, and uh, welcome. Uh, so my name is Daniela Wagner. I'm the Global Business Development Director for Jacobs Media, the largest B2B um, travel and hospitality media group. We organize events around the world and focus on thought leadership. Um, I'm really delighted to have with me today um, a very interesting panel. Um, and what we're going to be talking about is um, basically what keeps you up at night. Um, a lot of this conference um, is around investment and people telling success stories. And all of these people here have some amazing success stories to share. But what we really wanted to do in this, um, uh, in this session is to have a conversation about some of the challenges and possibly some of the setbacks that every individual in um, any career in the world experiences. Because, uh, you know, whether we work for a corporation or whether we're a serial entrepreneur, um, there are things that go well and things that do not go so well. So I'm very um, pleased and excited that this panel has agreed to join us because it's not always in easy to talk about the things that, uh, that, as I say, keep you awake at night. Um, the person who was actually pictured on the program is uh, Jan Kalet. So he is the CEO of Daniel Ost Group. And uh, some of you may already have seen that he probably has the most beautiful booth in the entire exhibition area over in the far corner. If you haven't seen it yet, please go and take a photo. It's the most inspirational flower arrangement that I've ever seen in the world. And when I asked him yesterday, whether they were all real, he said that over 80% are real and it's just amazing. Um, we also have Ulpa Shohan, who is the Chief Solutions Officer uh, for Beyond Bamboo and who was part of the Startup Den yesterday. And uh, she's going to share some of her journey with us. And um, uh, I think the idea of being a Chief Solutions Officer is also very interesting because there are challenges and there are successes but what you always need is solutions. And um, we also have Lorelai Regragui, Re 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 <laughs> yes. um, who is the founder and CEO of Stay K, um, a very innovative, experiential online booking platform um, backed by human beings. And she started her company just before COVID. She was also part of the startup then yesterday. And last but not least, the very youngest member of our panel is Mohamed Zran, who is the CEO and founder of Tenants. And he is actually only 15 years old. So he sees life from a completely different perspective to the rest of us and is just starting out on his journey. Anyway, um, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me and uh, thank you for being part of this panel. Um, let's start with you, Jan. Uh, you've obviously been working in your company uh, for a long time. Tell us about how you came to have the idea and, you know, how you actually made it happen in the first place. Um, yeah, I started at Daniel Lost when I was uh, 23 years old, so a good 10 years ago, <laughs> uh, which is actually the, biz the family business of my wife and her parents. Uh, so just uh, we decided together to join the business and uh, with the goal or the ambition to turn an already well-known established brand into a more international oriented uh, flower business. Um, and that has, has been a roller coaster ride, I would say, uh, with a lot of ups and a lot of downs, trying to build a highly creative business and turn that into a scalable International business isn't always easy because you have the creative part and you have the business side and balancing those two and, and trying to keep the balance right uh, is, is not always easy. So you started really uh, locally as a, as a Belgian company or how did that happen? We were already well known throughout the world, but we never had a, a, an international regional presence, I would say. And, and one of the first objectives that we set for the future was to uh, given our type of clients, which are usually higher end clients, royal families and so on, it was important to, to establish a presence nearby, um, which is also the, the main reason why we've set up a shop here in, in the Middle East to be closer to, to our clients. Great. Ulpa, you um, uh, said yesterday that, you know, you're a uh, women-inspired uh, company, which is fantastic. Um, uh, 
how did you identify the niche in the market and how did you start to make it happen? So as a women-led business, uh, we actually started out B2C um, and identified a need in the market. Um, sustainability has been at the core for us four directors of the business. Um, we've all kind of been in that space, just not quite known early on as to how we wanted to make that happen. Um, and now we've really sort of cemented in terms of finding that space and where the need is really, because for us, sustainability especially is the core of what we do and it's a case of where is that help really really needed um, and hospitality is one of those sectors that that really do with the help as well what time frame are we looking at how long ago did beyond bamboo start uh so beyond bamboo has been going since about 2016 um maybe a little bit longer than that i'm trying to think back now because we had covid in between right <laughs> the lost years of COVID. <laughs> the lost years of covid <laughs> Um, but uh, in terms of sustainability for the core, two of our directors have either lived in that lifestyle or been working in that space for a very long time. Um, you know, it's now become a, a buzzword, I guess. And so people know about it a bit more, but it has been around a lot longer um, than we realize. Great. Lorelai, your quick uh, uh, background to your story and and why you started Stay K and what you saw as the opportunity. Uh, so actually, I'm a hotelier. So I worked in the luxury hospitality industry for eight years before having the idea of Stay K. So I had experience in uh, operation, like a front office uh, agent, reservation agent. Then I moved to back of the house um, uh, roles from uh, marketing manager, uh, digital marketing um manager as well. So all those combined experiences, let's say, in the hospitality industry made me see what was uh, lacking in terms of support towards the hoteliers and what hotels could do more as well toward their guests. So it started like that, you know, accumulating all this experience, all this observation. And also I had, um, I was lucky enough to be in touch with the guests a lot directly through my different roles, because this is where you see the missed opportunities and how you can do things better, let's say. And how did you set out to make things better at Wutu Stay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So basically, so first, so with these combined experiences and also it was about observing a market gap, right? Because staycation has been popular for the longest time, especially in the UAE, which is where we're based at the moment. And uh, but there hasn't been any kind of platform where you can easily browse through, you know, staycation fit properties and having also this kind of human touch to it where you can reach out to someone and get some advice rather than just relying on influencer review or some paid advertising that you see on some local media. We promote all of our hotels equally because it's not like we're going to push out one hotel more than the other. That's not what we do. You know, it's about helping you pick the best, the ideal key to your next getaway, let's say. So, so now we're starting like doing things better by our booking journey on our website being very much transparent because we don't have any algorithm behind. So it's basically, you know, depending on the filters you choose, you will get the selection of hotels that are relevant to you. And also we never mark our price as discounted or marked up. You see, you always see, you know, this flashy kind of sales discount on most online travel agency, but most of the time they're very much biased because you will see like a 70% on one OTA and then you go on the hotel website, well, it's the same price. So what's the discount, you know? It's like, okay. So we removed all these marketing gimmicks. And it's like, it's about, you know, providing value and an experience, you know, and depending on your budget, there is an experience for everyone. So that's how we starting to make things a bit better, you know, for hotels and for local travelers alike. Fantastic. And Mohammed, you spoke yesterday about being a high school student and, um, uh, identifying this sort of hole in the market. Um, first of all, as a high school student, how did you have enough time to think about that? And uh, and what enabled you to identify that gap in the market? Uh, so first of all, my name is Mohamed Zahran. I'm a founder, I'm a founder of Tenants. Tenants is a property management app that helps digitalize and streamline the day-to-day -day operations of landlords and tenants. And you said, how did I find the gap? So first of all, I looked at how most successful startups in the Middle East region, how they find their, how, how they find their ideas. 
and I saw the one thing that was common with a lot of them is they Arabize ideas. They look at ideas that are being implemented in the West, like in North America and in Europe, and they bring it to the Middle East as the same uh, idea would have also demand. So then I was looking at uh, ideas that are already implemented but aren't in the Middle East. And one of the ideas that I found that really caught my eye was property management. And then I started doing research in it. This was in the summer break, so I had a lot of time on my hands. And then it was just like maybe a one or two hours working on it, maybe after school, maybe in the weekend. So I always found time. And and for the... There is a second question. No, that was the question, basically. How did you identify the need in the market? So the next question to you, actually, specifically, is um, how did your family feel about you deciding to pursue, you know, this early career? And how did you get the money to get started? Well, of course, uh, my father was very supportive, as he's always uh, been, ever since I'm a kid, he's always been putting me on the right path to success. And as a kid, uh, my mind was always, like, business-oriented. And this was, of course, thanks to my father as he helped me uh, develop this mindset. And my father was very supportive and uh, he's, uh, for the development, he's funding it. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to move on to talking about cultural sensitivities. Um, you know, we are here in the beautiful kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, an emerging destination. Um, the Middle East has grown significantly over the last couple of decades. I remember visiting Oman 30 years ago and uh, being amazed by its beauty, but also by the fact that really no one had ever been to visit it. Um, how do, and yet all of us come originally from somewhere outside of this kingdom. How did you uh, look at the global expansion of your business, taking into consideration what your core values were as a business and, um, and then adapt them, not necessarily just to this region, but to the different parts of the world that you're working in? So maybe Ulpa, we could start with you because you've, you've had a lot of experience in this area. Yeah, I think um, one of the things when you're talking about a sort of expanding um, because for us, you know, sustainability and ethics is, is a huge thing. It's like, okay, so we want everybody to be a part of this. But we've always found that if you don't actually have a seat at the table, you can't influence change. And so that's been kind of the guiding part of what's been bringing us to different areas. First of all, the need, because we've sort of been approached, I guess, to say, look, you're the experts and that's really what we want help with. Um, what can you do to help us? And even though sometimes, and, and it kind of leans in a little bit to the setbacks, actually, is you kind of want to help everybody <laughs> all at once, um, which, can, which can in itself be a challenge, right? Because it's like, well, we want to help everyone in the whole world with what we do. But you've got to sort of go, right, okay, well, let's start somewhere and then sort of build from there. And obviously with the, the whole region, the whole GCC region itself, there's a huge expansion. You know, you just said it with Oman, nobody really going there. Um, so how can we bring tourism to the area, um, which is really key because it's part of the, the growth of the economy as well. And tourism plays a huge part for a lot of countries. Um, so for us, it was definitely like, so where is the need? And you say uh, the essential thing is to have a seat at the table. What does that mean, for example, in this region? How would you define having a seat at the table? It's, a, it's, a, it's about roundtable talks, really, because it's having all the stakeholders involved around a table and everybody having their input because everyone comes from a different perspective. I mean, I think everyone knows what ours is <laughs> and our mission is, but everyone has a different... For somebody, it's about the timeline. For somebody else, it's about the budget. For somebody else, it's about, well, how is this going to look? and feel and what does this mean in terms of a customer experience and what often happens is those conversations happening in silo and I think it's really important that everybody who is involved is sitting around a table literally to have those conversations but not thinking about it later in the journey it's got to start at the very beginning. No I, I think that's absolutely right and uh, and that way you can shape the future development of it. So, Jan, you know, you were talking about the fact that you've opened an office in the Middle East. Um, 
Uh, when did you start that? Why did you choose the Middle East? Why not North America or Japan? Um, and and how did you then kind of evolve your European way of thinking to 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 meet the demands and expectations of this part of the world? Yeah, we've been we've been doing business in the Middle East for for quite some time, and then the the, the reason why we chose Saudi was just because of the huge potential. First time I came here in 2019, it was before it was popular to become to Saudi, I think. It's only started just after that and before they announced all the mega projects. Um, the people here are just so amazing. They're open for business from all over the world. Uh, it was a bit of a, uh, a challenge, I'd say, to adapt to the local mindset, the local culture. But as a company, we've been always very diverse. We have uh, about 50 nationalities working for us, I think, from South Africa to Japan to England. So we've always been very, very diverse. And also we see it a bit as our responsibility to educate the Saudi people in terms of flowers. It would, would be amazing to, to bring the floral business to the local Saudi people to show them what you can do with flowers and have them involved in it as well. We've just done this project with support of some local Saudi florists and just seeing them working with us, with our team, was really amazing. And they were like, wow, I mean, we can do this. We have the capabilities in this country to be creative and to showcase our, our capabilities. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's about embracing diversity, embracing the local culture and trying to add a little bit of a European flair and touch to it, I think. And, and all those things combined are, are really great. Lorelai, uh, for you, it's slightly different because you actually start your based here in the region and you started your company here. But still, um, how did how did you, you know, adapt your business to to meet the cultural expectations of this market? Uh, OK, I mean, it's true because, of course, I have like extensive experience already in the region. But then when you come on the other side, you know, being an unknown brand, um, you know, having to prove your worth, that you're worth uh, entering business with, you know, another company and especially within the luxury hospitality industry, it's big brands out there. Uh, they have, you know, high expectation. They want to protect their uh, their branding, you know, how their hotels are portrayed. Uh, but I think one thing that I noticed and I very cherish about this region is that people are very open. You know, they as long as you have their best interest at heart in terms of business, of course, they they welcome your idea. You know, as long as you, they see that you're genuine about it, that you want to do good for their company. You know, I in that sense, I didn't face any challenges, let's say, surprisingly. You know, I think it was only part of the business setup and everything that was quite a bit challenging because it's a lot to navigate and it's very, very, like, rapidly changing you know every new regulations that comes in and everything like we set up the company back in march 2020 uh two weeks before lockdown <laughs> so and from then like so much change you know you can register now in ue in mainland without having you know a local partner and so on and so forth so i would say this is the challenging part but in terms of you know doing business with others in the region um it has been like a like quite, uh, like quite surprisingly, uh, you know, uh, very, very open, I would say. Well, I, I did notice yesterday your timeline of uh, literally opening the company um, just as COVID hit. I mean, how did you, how did you survive that time <laughs> when you were just a startup and presumably had, but you didn't have a coffer full of banknotes to to fall yeah. back on how yeah. did you survive that so now we're we're going down onto the the, the real you know setbacks and the, the hard times so yeah i mean um so you know so what happened is that so i got the idea for stake back uh end of october 2019 at the time i was still like trying to build up the business plan and everything and then i decided to go to a web developer that i knew from my previous works I went to London, met with him. He was like, Lola, you're onto something. Give it a go. So I was like, okay, you know what? Let me head back to Dubai. Let me pitch. I went out and sent it message on LinkedIn to, you know, the regional uh, director for uh, e-commerce of Marriott, of Hilton, of Accor. I was like, let's just dive into it. Let's see, is it worth it? Is it worth it to register the company? Because for me, I mean, and I, of course, for everyone, you know, it's beyond saying, oh, I have my own company, but it's like, is my idea useful to someone? you know, and for the people I'm creating it for. 
right? So it started like that. And then I registered like a pitch video. There's a simple one in Dubai pitching my idea. I didn't have a lot of followers. I had like 200 followers on Instagram, you know, and a few, a uh, few couple hundreds on LinkedIn. And I posted the video. I was like, let's get out there. Like, you know, let's jump out. And, uh, and I got many leads of investment. It was quite crazy, even from a Qatari uh, a fund. Uh, it, it was just off the bay, back of yeah. the posting. <laughs> you know, because I went, you know, I just spread the word. I kept talking about it just to understand, like, am I really onto something? Is it worth pursuing? And would it go good? And, uh, and it was and it was crazy. The hotel wanted to onboard and everything at corporate level. I was like, oh, my God. OK, let's register the company. And then COVID hit. <laughs> so, you know, of course, everything, you know, dropped down. And uh, at this stage, you know, it's about resilience. Uh, it was very, very, very tough, you know, mentally speaking. And but then, you know, when you keep in touch with the hoteliers, uh, with the people you already met, you know, this is where you need to ask for help, I think. I learned to ask for help uh, through many people that I met uh, on my way. You know, I called them my little angels on the way of building Seike. And it's very important, you know, and uh, it's through those conversations. This kept me going, you know, and as for, you know, money wise, uh, well, the big investment I was expecting, well, fell off. So I was uh, literally begging, uh, you know, the free zone and the co-working space to, you know, please, you know, bear with me. Bear with me. I went back home. Like I thank my parents, you know, my family that I have like, you know, <laughs> a little bed where I can, you know, sleep at night there. You know, I've been very thankful because some people don't doesn't have like this uh, option to to fall back, literally. So me, I went out. I was like, uh, there's no need to, you know, burn cash here that I actually don't have. Uh, no need to go in debt. <laughs> you know, let's try to, you know, um, don't go into the this uh, this path. Uh, so, yeah, so basically I hang in there. I actually went back to Paris. Uh, I actually worked in the supermarket for six months, <laughs> you know, coming from the luxury hospitality industry. I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm uh, getting everything back on track. I was looking for a new investor. I was pitching to the hotel. I was doing the web development on the side. And I was like, let me get a day job, you know, so that I can handle my daily expense, my flight back and forth to Dubai, you know, for any important meeting that I have. And then, well, November 2021 is where I unlocked the phone, the pre-seed phone. And then I was able to go back to Dubai. So, yeah. Can I yeah, <laughs> just add, add course, something? Sure. Yeah, just a really important point that you've made there. And I think, you know, this is some great advice for Mohammed as well, you know, as, as a startup. is when you are starting up, often it's just you or maybe you and a few other people. And you know what your skills and knowledge is and what your expertise are. But there'll be gaps. There'll be gaps in that, in that circle of, you know, the people who are leading the business. And I think this is really important to then surround yourself with a network who are able to help. And actually, there's some amazing people out there who are willing to mentor and help, you know, startups and businesses and really wanted to put their, you know, not necessarily just money, just time is also important. And I think people only look at the finance side of it and think, oh, I need money to help. But sometimes it's not. It's, mm -hmm. it's the time, it's the experience and expertise that we don't think about. If I can also say something, I think many experienced, seasoned business professionals have an ego. And by just going and asking for advice for, for time, they feel flattered and they are willing to support you. So don't be afraid to go out and ask even if you think they're unreachable, just by going and asking, I think you can can reach a tremendous amount of, of support. It's something we I've done as well. I'm I know I'm not the best at certain things in business, and you don't need to to be. It's a, when you know it's already quite important, and then you can just go out and find people that can help you with that. I think that's a that's a really good point um, because it's the it's the one thing you never think to do you know you always you have so much work on and you're under such constant pressure that you need to be able to take that step back and say actually what is the challenge that i'm really trying to address here and i was wondering for you jan you know you you obviously um have married somebody who is the daughter of the founders of the business um so that creates two challenges you know uh one is how do you protect uh, a work-life balance? Um, and the other one is, you know, where who do you turn to for advice? Or also when you're 
terrified or not sure about the next steps to take? Yeah, um, it's a very tricky situation I'm in sometimes because I have the head of being son-in-law and CEO of the company and, and husband, husband and of the father. creative director. And so we made very clear guidelines when we're at a family gathering. It's not about business because you can always talk about business. Um, it's a challenge, especially now that I'm, I'm traveling a lot. It's been almost three weeks since I've seen my wife and son. So as a young father, it is kind of challenging. To, to, you know, to maintain a healthy balance. People always underestimate sometimes, I think, the difficulty of, of being a young entrepreneur trying to build a business internationally. Uh, but on the other hand, luckily, they do really understand what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And I think that helps, helps a lot that we're doing it for the same business with the same goal, the same vision. Uh, but I have to admit it's sometimes very lonely when you're traveling and when you're out here three weeks. And although you're very busy, during the day with meetings and, and networking and doing business, when you come back to the apartments or the hotel room later in the evening alone, you think like, you know what, I wish I was with was my son. So, so yeah, it is a challenge. Of course. Um, Ulpa, I don't know anything about your family background or how you cope with the work-life balance. Um, again, I think it's all about having an amazing support network around you. Um, I'm very fortunate. I've got an amazing husband. I have well, add two adult children, they're not children, uh, adults, <laughs> um, who are, you know, towards the end of their education. Um, and just kind of them understanding that there'll be times where I'm pressured and I've got a lot on and I've got to, you know, it means somebody else picking things up um, along the way and being able to say no to things because I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm a very social and, and person. So being able to say no sometimes is actually just as powerful as saying yes to everybody for everything as well. So I think that's also quite important. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right that being able to say no actually empowers you to have the time to think and to just breathe and say, right, what are the next steps? Um, so I really want to to ask uh, another question. Mohammed, you know, you're sitting here at the beginning of your career. Um how are you going to, I think your idea is amazing. And the, uh, not only did you win an award, but you also saw that there was lots of interest in this room, in this environment and throughout the world for the solution that you've come up with. Um, what are your next steps? How are you going to develop this after today when you go back? Uh, so, so far from the feedback that I've got from other people, I see that it's best if I expand into more than one area, not just uh, focus on property managers on landlords, that also like residential uh, like residential buildings, like offices, malls, I mentioned yesterday, also compounds, uh, maybe even uh, into hotel, uh, maybe even into hotel software. So I, I think that there are many ways of expanding the software itself. And also there are many markets to expand to further than the Middle East, because uh, Europe also still doesn't have like a... Um, a property management software that's widespread, like for example, in the United States, there are a few that are conquering the market. For uh, for example, at, um, there is a startup called Doorloop. It's have it has like fifty thousand users in the United States, and there is another company. It's called uh, Entrata. It has an eight billion dollar valuation. So uh, those are based in the United States, and their focus is in the United States. And Europe is still kind of empty. I couldn't find anything that's based in Europe. Also, Southeast Asia, the Asian countries, they're very like, um, the houses are small because uh, the real estate prices are expensive. So therefore, people have to rent. So most of the people that are renting, most of the people that are renting are renting from the same vendors or from the same companies. So that's also an uh, area that I'm willing to uh, explore. Yeah, that's it. So you've basically got a global expansion <laughs> plan ahead of you. <laughs> I think you really need to listen to Ulpa's advice as well is uh, global expansion. And I think you've, you've identified, you know, the exact right opportunities, but it's very important to have um, real local specialists who really deeply understand the market. For example, know, for Europeans often make the mistake of thinking the American market from a tourism perspective is such an important outbound market. 
and they think, you know, everybody speaks English, so it should be easy to do it. In fact, the American market is extremely complicated to get into. And if you don't have people with real deep local knowledge um, to assist you, you can blow a lot of money out of the window and not have any results at all. Um, I've personally, I've done some research about this also. And uh, most of the companies who uh, expand into a market that they, let's say, for example, let's say that they studied the market itself, but they didn't send somebody to like research and talk with the locals, talk with uh, their target audience, with their clients, face to face in the market that they want, that they want to expand to. They often waste a lot of money and the end result is nothing. So I plan to learn from other people's mistakes. And before I expand into any market, I plan to go uh, visit that place, learn culture, do research, talk with the locals, find my target audience and my target clients, and even like attend events like the, like these ones for, uh, with, for uh, to better learn the culture. Like when I came here, I learned what the demand is, and specifically in the, in the hospitality sector showing that there's more places for me to expand. So that's like also if I'm, if I'm going to expand somewhere that I'm not familiar with, uh, of course, hiring somebody in that, air, in that uh, region or in that country that's specialized in something like this, I see that as a must have. Well, it's all about establishing credibility, isn't it? Because uh, somebody who's known in the market is also your your card to credibility effectively because you're coming in as an outsider and you need to establish that credibility quickly and one of the best ways of doing it is not just through marketing but basically having a partner who is trusted in the local market um so we've only got a few more minutes now before we're going to finish this session um and i do really actually want to ask you the question that i asked in in the introduction um you know what <coughs> What keeps you awake at night? What is your 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 biggest fear, either for your business, if you're willing to share that with us, or or about yourself in managing that business? Um, Jan, may I start with you? Uh, last night it was my neck, but uh, I think in general, <laughs> um, I don't want to disappoint people. Uh, being my wife or father-in-law who founded the business, and, and my main objective is keeping the extremely high creative standards that he has set, uh, always keeping in mind the principles of, of design and creativity rather than making money. Uh, I could make a lot more money by jeopardizing the creative standards on the short term, but in the long term that would not, uh, would not do good to the business. So, so what keeps me up at night is, is finding the perfect balance between growing a business without losing the the high standards that have been set by the previous generation and yeah sounds very philosophical but uh, yeah i think there is it sounds really great because you see lots of examples actually of second generation um individuals ruining what was set up in yeah. the first generation you see that across all industries um Ulpa, what keeps you up at night and what's what's your biggest concern or fear um, I, I agree, you know, with what with um what Jan has said there, you know, in terms of credibility in that as well. And I think sometimes when you're you're at the very early stages after starting a business as well, is what's known as imposter syndrome. You know, you feel like sorry, which syndrome? Imposter syndrome. Yeah. So you feel like an imposter in the space. You're like, do I really know what I'm doing? And then you start doubting yourself because you're like, and then you have to take a step back and go, actually. No, I do know what I'm doing and just having that confidence. But I think what often really helps in that situation is having that passion and purpose, because when you've got the passion and purpose for what you're doing, um, that will kind of, you know, help you take you through in terms of having that confidence to keep going. So, yeah, sometimes it's like, are we kind of, you know, there is it sort of, but that brand identity part is also quite sometimes what keeps me up because you're like, especially when it's individual, because you do as a business, but you also do as an individual as well. And then when you start to dilute or grow, there's that part that can sometimes get lost a little bit. So making sure that that integrity and what you're all about remains, um, I guess. So, yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it does make sense. And I think especially with Beyond Bamboo, because, you know, 
you are about sourcing actual products and um, and services, but you're also about kind of the strategic advisory side of that, um, both on a private sector level, I guess, for the hotels and uh, properties that you work with, but also in terms of the international organizations that you're talking to, trying to educate them. So you're looking at it from a very kind of 360 perspective, and that's that's complicated to maintain and it's complicated to grow. And I suppose for you, the challenge would also be, you know, which bits going, which bit should you be focusing on? Because you can't be all things to all people. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and also when you're thinking about employing people as well, do they share the same passions as we do? Because that's really important to us and, you know, and wanting to be in this space um, rather than just seeing it as a job. Yeah. 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 Um, Lorelai, you already shared some of your your COVID experiences. And I think COVID was such an interesting time because it was the great equalizer, <laughs> for, especially for the travel and hospitality industries around the world. We were all exactly in the same position. Um, what keeps you up at night? Uh, time flying away. Uh, you know, it's like uh, you always feel like you're not fast enough. You're not doing enough. Uh, you know, there is that many ideas that you have so that much time you have on your hands and another thing that keeps me awake at night is also you know because right now we're starting a new fundraising and let's say I have kind of like a like not a double handicap but let's say I'm a solo founder uh it's woman-led then <laughs> and I don't have a team you know <laughs> so it's like multiple so you are literally at the moment still doing this on your own uh, yes Right. Yeah. Okay. I That's why there's no shit of time flying away. You know, you can. And also there is always limitation, you know, like at some point, of course, you can take, um, you know, a business live, you know, uh, the NVB's launch where you're uh, already having bookings. We're generating revenue for hotels with take a, which is a fantastic. Even I can't even believe it myself, you know, but at some point you have to realize that you have your own set of skills and limitation, you know. I've been hours on YouTube, you know, learning about SEO, social media. And of course, you have to stay curious when you're building something. You know, it's not like, oh, no, this is not my expertise. I'll, you know, just pay someone. Yes, you can if you have the money. But at the end of the day, it's your baby. Like, you know best, you know, and at some point, you know, have to be hands on a bit. And then once you know how to do it, have the basis for it, hire experts that do it for you, that are smarter than you in that sense. You know, so this is the stage where I'm at. I'm like, okay, I've taken it this far. Quite still in still disbelief, but now it's time to have experts by my side that will be way smarter than me on SEO, on this, on any other topic of the business, you know, to really like kind of scale up. So yeah, it's the notion of time and, you know, the fundraising is like, okay, let's see how that works out, you know. <laughs> and then it's, of course, uh, being able to trust those individuals to whom you are. Oh, yes. oh, yeah, this is, a, your this is like a, something uh, else <laughs> to keep me up at night. With you know? your business because <laughs> that, that's stage. very complicated. Uh, yeah. A bit like your imposter syndrome is like, you know, how this is my baby, but now I've got to trust someone to look after it. Yeah. Mohammed, I'm going to change the question for you um, rather than what keeps you up at night. What would you like to ask these three very accomplished individuals uh, which could help you on your journey? And not money. <laughs> no money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, no money. But I'm sure there's some people in the room who can give you some money, but um, not not this audience. You know. <laughs> um, I'd ask two questions. The first question would be, what do you think is the next appropriate step for me? And the second question would be, uh, how did you uh, raise funds? Um, uh, the next appropriate step for you if I was you, would be to look for an accomplished, experienced mentor who not necessarily knows a lot about your specific business, but about building a business in general. Uh, it's something I did when I was very young. It's somebody I'm still in touch with, and I keep asking him questions of all kinds, and he has helped me a lot during my business career. Um, second question, how I got... Before you go on to the second question, I wanted to say that uh, my father, before I came to this event, my father told me the same thing. My, my father told me to also to look for a mentor here. 
Yeah. No, no, it's, uh, it's uh, you have a smart father in that case. <laughs> uh, second question, how we got money. Uh, um, luckily, there was already some money when I started. Not enough to accomplish my vision. Um, I approached uh, an investor uh, to build our Middle Eastern brand. Uh, convinced them of the potential. Uh, I think uh, when they see your excitement and vision and share the belief in what you want to accomplish there are plenty of people with deep pockets willing to invest in good ideas it's just a matter of convincing them of the opportunity because you, you need to convince them of the the long-term objective uh, i think that's what's important for them and um, plenty of people uh, even here in this room are willing to support young entrepreneurs with bright ideas for sure so uh, i had another question for you um how would you say I can find a mentor here today? Uh, good question. In Saudi Arabia, I don't know specifically. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can try to be your mentor. I don't know if how that would work out. Um, uh, I think LinkedIn. Honestly, LinkedIn is a great platform to connect. I'm sure there are also business groups, uh, Chamber of Commerce. I think the government has plenty of opportunities as well to find the right people. Uh, and I can even ask around in the, the network I've built in Saudi Arabia the past few years to see if I can link you with some, some interesting people. Right, thank you. Um, I guess where you go from now is, and maybe this isn't just now with the future, is always to be curious, always ask questions, talk to people. Um, and then there's one thing I'm going to say, which I don't know if it's going to make sense, but don't be too attached to it going in a certain direction because sometimes things arrive, which might mean that this was your goal, but actually you go via this way to get to that goal. Um, so things can, because industries change, things change all the time. So just be open to change, um, which I think a lot of startups sometimes don't embrace that um, because we're so focused on what you want. Um, and I guess in terms of fundraising, before you even get to the point of an investor, family and friends, there are so many people I'm sure that you probably know within your network that would, you would absolutely be willing to support, um, knowing that, you know, it's helping something that you're passionate about, obviously getting a little something from it as well. <laughs> but family and friends would kind of be the first uh, point of call for something like this. Um, so, so the next step for you, I think you should look into, there is a lot of phones right now uh, for young entrepreneurs, I see it more and more often, which is fantastic for you. So I think it's great because you can join this kind of ecosystem where you'll be surrounded by like-minded individual, young individual like you. So you won't be like, you know, the, uh, the exception in the room, right? So you can relate, you know, your other people will be in high school or, or um, in university having other things on, our, on their hands. And they will also you know, facing the change challenges, you know, like how do people trust you as being a very young entrepreneur, right? So I think you need to step in into those rooms, you know, and you will be even surrounded by those same mentors. Uh, and of course, LinkedIn is a fantastic tool, you know, shouldn't be like, that's what I'm doing at the moment. You know, you Google, you know, angel investor, early stage, uh, you know, startup mentors, you know, as long as you have the right keywords, like just reach out and you'll be surprised, like as long as you, you don't copy paste, you know, your message to everyone, right? You make a tailor-made message. You make sure that it grabs their attention by their domain of expertise, of interest, whatever it may be, you know, uh, create a connection. Just don't spam people. That's my, <laughs> that's my only thing because honestly, it's such a simple thing to do, but it makes the whole difference from the start of, you know, the first message, the first, you know, sending the invitation connection. So... That will be my advice to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, that brings us to almost to the end of our session. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask our courageous and very honest panel here? <laughs> any questions? Something? Yes. Yes. I knew you had a question. <laughs> I guess for me, um, it, it is really, thank you for sharing. I think it's really hard to share setbacks and challenges um, on stage, or at least to a very public area. Yeah. Um, so it's been really uh, nice to hear because I also am starting in my career right now. 
So I always look at, um, let's say, uh, setbacks as a, more of a something I need to accomplish in order to continue on my. Can you tell me maybe in like a few words, um, how does it feel after? Like after you surpass that challenge or like after you've gone through that big hurdle, what is that feeling you get to be like, okay, now I'm on the right track? Uh, I think it's the best feeling in the world. Uh, it gives a, a, an adrenaline kick, a positive energy boost. Um, obviously, don't make a habit of having too many setbacks <laughs> to get the feeling. Um, but um, no, it's it's nice. And you can be proud of yourself sometimes that even if it's for you a big one, for others it might be just a minor setback. But it's okay that uh, to overcome them and uh, to be proud of yourself when you do and build on it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to say just a few words. It's a, a happy dance. <laughs> I second that. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, of course, it's an amazing feeling, but, you know, there is so much highs and lows, you know, in the life of, you know, chasing your dream, let's say. Uh, I think it's important to remain grateful. That's the keyword for me, you know, because... A couple of weeks ago, you were in a position where you're like, oh, my God, how am I going to, you know, uh, surpass that hurdle? And then you surpassed it. And then a couple of weeks later, you're like, oh, but it's not going fast enough. What am I doing wrong? You know, and then you pose, you're like, take a deep breath. You're doing fine. You know, be grateful for what you have at the moment and just keep, keep going. Mohamed, do you want to add something to that? So it was so <laughs> early on in your journey. That... Yeah, I think I'm still early in my journey to uh, relate to this. Just believe in yourself. <laughs> yes. Well, look, um, that brings us to the end of this session. Um, thank you so much for including this. I think that was great. Thank you, Jonathan, for the invitation. I've known Jonathan for over 25 years now. <laughs> and um, congratulations on this amazing event in this beautiful country. And thank you to thank wonderful you. panelists for sharing your insights and your truths with us. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.